Hello and welcome to this update video for Revit 2024. This year I've decided to do things slightly differently and in my previous video I concentrated on the platform changes for Revit 2024. This video will just focus on the structural updates and changes to 2024. However, I would also add some additional updates from Revit 2023.1 as well. OK, let's get going. We'll begin by looking at bending details. In the project browser, I'm just going to go ahead and open up a section. And you can see in this section here that we have this concrete formwork and then we have this non-standard shape that's actually detailed in it. We'll now create a bending detail for this non-standard shape. So I'll go ahead and select the rebar first. And you'll notice on the context panel, we have a new function called bending detail. We'll go ahead and select the bending detail. And the first thing we'll notice here is that when we're moving our cursor, the bending detail is orthogonal to the view. To control this, again, if we look on the context tab here, we can see that align to bar is switched on. So I'll leave that. And now I'll just go ahead and place down my bending detail. I'll also do a similar thing for one of the column links that you can see here. So again, we'll select a link and then we'll place down our bending detail. We'll now release the command and we'll take a look at the bending details in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to select this bending detail here. And if we take a look into the properties palette, we can now see that we have type driven bending details. So you'll notice here that this is a default one, but actually here I've got my own one that I've created called symmetry bending detail. And if I go ahead and select this, you can see now that we have a completely different configuration for this bending detail. So, of course, I actually have my segment lengths, but additionally here, you can see that I've got the angles, radiuses and so on. Also, if I look at the bending detail for the stirrup here, you can see that it's a bit difficult to actually see what's happening with the hooks. So, again, I can select this stirrup. And again, in the properties palette, you can see that I've got various different bending details for this. So here you can see that we're just showing dimensions, but no information for the hooks at all. However, if I now go and choose symmetry bending detail 2, for example, in here, you'll see that we've now got this offset way of displaying the rebar shape. Of course, now that this is offset, you can see it's much easier to actually understand the segment lengths, the angles and the lengths of the hook. And we've got a final one here, which is called symmetry bending detail 3. And here we can see that we've got a slightly different configuration again, which helps us understand what's going on with the hooks and the bending radii and so on. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the type properties for these bending details. So I'll select edit type. And in the type properties dialog here, we can see under the graphics area here, we have representation. And you'll notice now we can see those three different representations. We've got standard, unfold or offset. If we look under the dimensions heading here, you can see that segment length dimensions are activated. We can also set a dimension style for that particular segment length style. We have our hook lengths, uh, angular dimensions, other dimensions and so on. So all of this can be highly configured to actually create a bending detail that suits your particular application. OK, so we'll close down the type properties dialog. Now, just a couple of comments on these bending details. I think they're a great step forward. But here in the UK, we wouldn't necessarily use these. We might just use them in the bending schedule. And we'll talk about that very shortly. A couple of things that I've noticed here is we can't actually tag these bending details, which is a bit of a shame. But I'd imagine in the future Autodesk will implement this and that will actually open up new workflows. So I'd imagine that things like ticking and tagging would be possible using these new bending details. But again, we'll have to wait and see for that. Let's now take a look at the bending details in relation to the bending schedule. So what I'm going to do here is go ahead and open up my rebar schedule. So in the properties palette, I'll go ahead and open up the schedule. And we can see here that we've got the schedule opened up and you can see the final column on the right hand side is actually showing the bending detail. In the properties palette, I'll go ahead and edit the fields in here and we can clearly see that we've now got a new field called bending detail. In the schedule properties dialog, if I select the formatting tab here and then I select the bending detail option, you can see here we have a new button for the field properties. I'll go ahead and select edit here and once again you can see that the bending detail options can be configured for our bending schedule. Now in this example here you can see that I'm actually proposing to show values but unlike the bending sketch here we could also just show names which would actually just show those segment lengths so I'd see A, B, C, D and so on. Anyway 
we'll go ahead and use all of these defaults here. And what I'll then do is actually look at drawing sheet. Now, bear in mind here, you won't better actually see the bending details in the schedule itself. You can only see those on the drawing sheet. Now, to open the sheet, I'm just going to right mouse over the bending schedule here, and I'll go to open sheet. We'll click OK to open up both of the sheets in here, and then we'll see those bending details in action. Now, again here, if I zoom in, I can now clearly see those bending details added into my bending schedule. Now what's quite nice with this is the actual image sizes will adapt when we actually increase or decrease the actual size of the schedule. If we take a look at the instance properties in the palette, you can see here that we can adjust the row height as well. So if I typed in 30, for example, here, you'd see I get much more space for my bending details. However, you'd probably only want to do that if you're showing particular images. So you can see here we've got resize rows and you can see it's only at this point resizing the image rows. Now at the minute we're forced to actually have a rebar image for every single bar but again I'd imagine in the future Autodesk will implement a tool where we can actually just show bending details of perhaps non-standard shapes but nevertheless I think this is a really good feature for other regions and countries. Let's now take a look at the analytical model improvements. To do this we'll go ahead and open up our 3D view. In the 3D view, you can already see that some of the analytical model has already been modelled for us. What I'm going to do here is start by showing how to create a curved analytical panel. To do this, we'll select the Analyze tab, and on the Analyze tab, you can see that we have a panel option. In the pull down, you can now see that we have panel by extrusion. If we look at the context panel, you can see here that we can actually sketch arcs, or we can just go ahead and pick lines. So in this example here, I'm going to pick this line. And of course, now you can see that we have an analytical panel generated. We can then use the shape handles to be able to manipulate the analytical panel. So in this example here, I'm going to actually have it spanning from the bottom of the slab here to the top of the beam. Once we've created the panel, we can then set the properties. So here, I'm just going to select the analytical panel. And if we look into the instance properties, we can set a valid structural material we can then set our structural roll. So in this case, it might be something like a wall. We can then set the thickness. So I'm going to make this one 250 millimeters. And then we can set the analyze as. And in this case, we're going to just simply analyze this as gravity. And of course, if we chose to use the Dynamo player to actually create a physical model from the analytical model here, this is, of course, the properties that it uses to actually develop that physical model. Let's now take a look at assisted association. To do this, I'm just going to open up our level six structural plane. And we can now see here that we've got some structural framing in the plane view. I now want to create an analytical model to represent this structural frame. So again, on the analyze tab, we'll select the member tool. And you'll notice now on the context panel, I've currently got start in point definition. So that's going to allow me to create an analytical model from the start and end of these members here. But also now you can see we've got our new function of assisted association. So now I'm just going to go ahead and use pick lines. I can then select the center line of my framing members in here. And as well as obviously creating the analytical model, it would also create the association for me automatically. So let's actually check this now. So I'm going to go ahead and select this analytical model in here. And if we look into the properties palette, we can clearly see that the structural role is beam. You can see that the section type has been associated as well as the material. This is, of course, a much quicker way of actually generating the analytical model. However, if we wanted to automate the full creation of an analytical model, we would simply just use Dynamo Player. So again, to look at this, you can see here that we have analytical automation on the analyze panel. And if we go ahead and select this, we can then see that Dynamo Player is launched. And you'll notice here that we can go from analytical to physical or from physical to analytical. So obviously, this is the fastest way to actually generate an analytical model if we've already got a physical model created. But of course, we can also do the reciprocal. Let's say that the engineer has already created the analytical model. Then, of course, I can then go ahead and create the physical model as a technician directly from that engineering model. Finally, we'll take a look at some loads. So again, I'm just going to zoom into the analytical model here. And again, on the analyze tab, you can see that we have a function called loads. If I select loads, 
We'll notice here that this is greatly simplified. So in previous releases of Revit, we had six types of load. We had point, line, and area, and the same for hosted. But of course here, you can see that we've just got three. And the reason for this is everything now is automatically hosted. But you'll notice now that if I click on the point load tool, you'll notice that I can place this point load on an endpoint, or I can just simply pick a position along an analytical member. Of course, the point load will be hosted to that member that I select. Once again, if I go to the line load, again here, you can see that I can create a line load on an existing host, or I can define a path by simply sketching it. And finally, if I go to the area load, again, that can be done on a host, or I can define a boundary. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and place a point load. And perhaps what I want to do is place a point load along this member at a specific distance from the end. So what I could do here is instead of using on end point, I'll use pick position. I can then select my host in here, and you can now see we have our analytical load. Now to set the position of it, I can select it, and you can see we get temporary dimensions, just like we would on any other uh, element. And then we can actually set that dimension back to this node. So let's say that we want this at 1500. You can now see I've then been able to set that point load. So that's a big improvement on loads. Okay, so we've now looked at all of the new structural features and improvements in Revit 2024. See you again soon.